When the clay is really soft, we have to be more gentle with it versus when the clay is more dry, that sometimes we have soft clay days and other times we have harder clay days. Sometimes we're more gentle with ourselves and other times we can push ourselves further. So It's a different part of our brain that we're exercising when we're doing hands-on and we're setting aside the technology and the constant feed of information that comes in. They have to respond to the clay see what the clay does, change their thought process, if it's working, if it's not working. And so I think it helps develop the brain in a way that we desperately need in education. And it's not just something pretty to hang on a wall. It's an expression of the student themselves, And it's something very sacred. As we celebrate National Art Week, my hope is that we can just be experiencing and looking and celebrating student work and what they're doing, the teachers' efforts to create high access to quality arts programs, and also the parents and guardians who support their teachers in the arts programs in Davis School District. The best expectation that I can have out of my kids is that they can accomplish difficult things and that if they put in the time and effort to tackle difficult things, they can do anything. Honestly, I hope at the end of the day, my students understand and know that I love them and that I care about them. I want them to feel safe and I want them to be personally connected to everything they do. I think when they experiment with the clay and then come away with recognizing that they have confidence to create with the clay, and whether it's clay or a job or math or English, like they've tried something new, had success with it, and they can take that confidence and experience with them into other areas of life. Creating makes you happy, makes you feel productive, makes you feel worthwhile, and that you, know, you don't have to be an artist to be creative, but whether it's drama, singing, art just makes everything better. I'm Ryan Van Adder, I'm the principal here at Meadowbrook, and a couple of months ago I got approached by Tree Utah and they asked if they could plant one to ten trees here, and I said, oh sure, that would be great. And then I got another call saying, oh, we're already coming and we're going to plant 50 trees. They had approached John Swain, the district office, and asked, is there a school that we could do this project? And John thought of Meadowbrook. So we had had a bunch of trees removed last summer. They were dying along our fence line. And Chevron is actually sponsoring a grant for the district uh, through the Davis Education Foundation to provide grants to schools for their multicultural clubs. And Meadowbrook, we were the first ones to apply and get that grant. And so it worked out really great for us to invite our multicultural club students and our student council. We had about 50, 60 kids that got to be a part of it. I'm Amy May, I'm the executive director of Tree Utah. We are a statewide nonprofit that works to connect plantings like this at schools and at parks and open lands. So we do these plantings about 20 times a year and sometimes it's just with an individual grade level at a school, sometimes it's the whole school, anywhere between three and 50 trees per day. We're so excited to have you know, the support of Chevron and the district support and the teacher support and volunteer groups that wanna come and make a difference in their communities. So we were so shocked by the outpouring of support. We had a lot of employees here. We also had support from the Davis Education Foundation. Several board members came out. Young Automotive had some volunteers come out. They're very active with the Education Foundation. District employees, parents, community members, folks who live here in this neighborhood just started coming out of their houses to help us plant trees. It felt good to come together in a safe way and give back to our community. What's better than the lightweight, cordless Hoover Evolve vacuum? Getting the Evolve Plus a Hello, I'm Reed Newey, Superintendent of Davis School District, and we are here today at Snow Horse Elementary. Wanted to take a moment and thank our great community for their observance of 9-11 uh, Patriots Day the past week. And Miss Joni Slater, the principal of Snow Horse, is here with me to describe what happened here at her school. 
Yeah, so good morning. I'm Joni Slater, principal of Snow Horse Elementary. And on Saturday, our community came out in commemoration of the 20th anniversary of September 11th to do service on our school grounds. We had about over 70 uh, community members show up, including children. They mowed lawns, pulled trees, weeds. It's just a fabulous way for the community to show support for Snow Horse, and we're really grateful. Thank you, Ms. Slater, and I echo her thanks to the community here at Snow Horse and across the district. At Snow Horse, this is one of our largest. A lot of uh, uh, grass area, <laughs> rocks, and, and uh, the community just did such a fantastic job. And throughout our district, we had all of our students that were really joined in and participated in commemorating 9-11 with service. We had multiple items for students of need that were collected, food, supplies, our young automotive group, our great partner with our Davis Education Foundation hosted Stuff the Bus. We had so many volunteers who did so much for the community in commemorating 9-11. We're just grateful for our community that does remember the sacrifice of others and is willing to sacrifice to make our communities, our schools better. So thank you. We love you. We love our students and we appreciate all that was done on 9-11 to commemorate that day in our history. My name is Shanda Stenger and I am the Fine Arts Supervisor in Davis School District. As we approach National Art Week, we are so excited in Davis School District to highlight and celebrate each student in their arts programs. Over the last two weeks, we were able to catch up with four amazing art teachers and it's amazing to see what these students and teachers are doing every day. My name is James Todd Young, everybody knows me by Todd. I teach at Syracuse High School. I teach ceramics. We're taking a step back in time. From a historic standpoint, pottery was one of the first art forms that was developed. Every culture utilized ceramics in one fashion or another, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians. We do assignments that connect it back to Anasazi Indian pottery with the kids doing coil pots and trying to develop their own pieces of artwork and as part of applying their hands to that raw material and in the process of learning the skills that it takes to produce a piece of three-dimensional, non-digital work, it takes a lot of kids in that out of their, their realm of comfort. And it, I think it makes them start thinking outside the box. And I find that it, when kids in that are patient with themselves and they're willing to put in the time and develop those skills and that the end product becomes more meaningful for them and, and in most cases in that they end up with a piece in that that is spectacular and uh, represents them, they represents the school, it represents the district in a very rewarding way. Hi, my name is Kirsten Johnson. I teach at Shoreline Junior High. I teach art, I teach photo, studio art, painting and 3D. So today we're working on watercolor contour drawings of their friends and family. And so they take a marker and they don't look at their paper so that they get a really um, fun, abstract, very free drawing of a, of a face. And then we're going to be actually implementing watercolor techniques into that. It's an important subject because they really are using their brains and their hands to do different things that they don't usually do. The most fun part about my job is seeing the kids be creative and having friends and being able to socialize during that time and just watching them grow. They get so good by the end of the term. So my name is Wendy Dimmick Smith and I've been at the school since it opened. I have been at Northridge for 30 years and I love my room. I have an amazing room. My goal is to create a good vibe and a safe haven where the kids want to come and be themselves here. 
today we are drawing a bottle. So we talked about reflections, leaving highlights, and then they had to do something creative. So a hole in it, uh, something spewing out, a bug crawling up the side. That's the plan for today. So a lot of these art kids aren't, <laughs> aren't sports oriented, but they love the creative side and it gives them a kind of like an extracurricular activity, something that they go home and they love it so much that they keep working on it. So I, I think art is very personal and I encourage the kids to draw, paint objects or people that are meaningful, you know, not just something they have no interest in. So I think that's important. My name is Shalise Marks. I have taught at Leighton High for 23 years and I teach ceramics full time. I try to focus on how students respond to the clay and life lessons that we can learn from the clay. Like, for example, when the clay is really soft, we have to be more gentle with it versus when the clay is more dry that sometimes we have soft clay days and other times we have harder clay days. Sometimes we're more gentle with ourselves and other times we can push ourselves further. So It's a different part of our brain that we're exercising when we're doing hands-on and we're setting aside the technology. We'd like to call our meeting to order, express our appreciation for all of you that are with us this evening. And um, if you're here to make a public comment and not, not yet signed up, uh, Ms. Hansen is to my left under the clock. If you would like to sign up, you can visit with her. We'll have public comment period here in a few minutes. But tonight we want to begin our meeting with a great opportunity to hear a student performance from the Bountiful Junior High Madrigal Choir. And we appreciate uh, Ms. Sh Ms. Shanda Stanger, our fine arts supervisor, for organizing this always. Shanda, we invite you, if you would, to come to the dais and explain to us, or to the podium, and explain to us a little bit about what we're going to hear. Superintendent, we are so glad to be here today. Um, we have Miss Casey Bradbury here with us with four students who are the section leaders of the Madrigal Group. And I want to just introduce Miss Casey Bradbury and have her share a little bit of the story behind why they chose this song and why it's important. Good evening. Uh, we have four incredible students uh, with us tonight, but we have even more amazing students who are 
representing Bountiful Junior High um, in the choir program. And we chose the song, You Will Be Found, because we realized that during middle school, or during junior high, junior high years especially, um, kids tend to get lost. And they don't quite know where they fit in. They don't know if they, if they truly are found. Um, and so we feel it's important to find everyone that we can. And so this is our message of hope. This is our message of inclusion. This is our message of love. And my students with me tonight, um, Isabel Blackburn, Michael Blower, Fielding Rupp, and Lindsay Park.
That was great. Thank you so much. I want to mention that uh, the, uh, the teacher of these young people is Casey Bradbury, who many of you know uh, in the district, but many that are here might not know this, that this last year Casey was chosen as the teacher of the year for our district and comp competed at the state level and ended up being runner-up to the state winner. We're very proud of her and very proud of the things that she has done. And for you young students that are representative of your group, what a great opportunity to, to hear you and to uh, know the good work that you're doing. We appreciate that very much. We've got a plaque that I'd like to present. I'm going to invite Superintendent Nui to come down. So if the students and Casey, if you'll come up and anybody else that's with you from the school, we can invite them to come up if there are. Before we have the Pledge of Allegiance, I just want to make sure that I don't forget, I already have once, to excuse Ms. Tanner and Ms. Stevenson from tonight's meeting. They are joining us electronically, but we ask that they be excused. And at this time, we would invite all of you to stand, and Michael Blower from Bountiful Junior High is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We are now going to move to our board recognition. This evening we have the privilege of uh, uh, recognizing one of our outstanding teachers in the district, Mr. Heath Wolf. And I'm going to invite uh, school director Mr. Dave Tanner if he'll come to the podium. President Robinson, school board, and uh, Superintendent Newey, it's with uh, great pleasure that I am able to recognize, um, as you saw, one of our finest here uh, this evening, uh, Mr. Heath Wolf. And you've seen others that have just been uh, fascinating to watch in the classrooms. We are blessed to have great junior high teachers, but also those in our performing arts program. So, uh, and one of those is Mr. Heath Wolf. I have been able to uh, view his classroom many times. And to witness the great talent and ability he has in the classroom. I have a prepared uh, thing I'd like to read just to uh, be able to uh, recognize him to his fullest and what this award really means. So uh, back in 1976 there was a magazine called the uh, Downbeat Magazine and it produces um, a lot of great articles in there but it also has a recognition in the magazine for student uh, music awards and uh, basically, it, re it uh, recognizes uh, great musicians, student musicians from around the country. And this prestigious award is um, basically we would call it equivalent to the Grammys. Now, for the second time in three years, and this is, this is really a rare thing, but for the second time in three years, Farmington Junior High School Jazz Ensemble has received this coveted award. They first received this prestigious award in 2019 and again in 2021. Uh, where they are named the division winner of the junior high school large jazz ensemble division. Uh, from Downbeat Magazine, I quote, in music, as in sports, it takes much more than great talent to succeed. Talent must be combined with hard work, 
rigorous practice, and the support of caring, sensitive mentors. And such as we've seen is uh, Mr. Heath Wolf. He is a very uh, strong mentor and a caring uh, coach to these students. Uh, this past year, despite COVID restrictions and accommodations made last year for uh, the safety of all students involved in his band program, uh, the uh, uh, success, success of this program under Mr. Heath Wolf's direction uh, in keeping the students safe, uh, but also being able to practice as much as they possibly can also uh, were recognized nationally for uh, an outstanding jazz ensemble. Uh, Mr. Wolf will always say, quote, it's because of the kids. And to him, it really is about, all about the kids. He has, devoted his, he has devoted his career and life to helping these young students reach the heights that they would never have reached had they not had a great instructor as uh, Mr. Heath Wolf. And for 21 years, he has served as band director at uh, Farmington Junior High School. So at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Heath Wolf and uh, recognize also his principal, Mr. Ben Hill, and uh, invite them to share anything or take comments or questions from y'all and before the recognition is given. So I'll put the spotlight I think on you them. Should, you should and I'll also, so on the TV. Oh, yeah, right there. I like one of my hands. Introduce who's here with you, too. Yeah, well, let me say something. Yeah. Um, like, I just want to echo what Dave Tanner said. Um, <laughs> there. I don't want to. <laughs> um, you know, Heath Wolf is an outstanding music educator. Um, I've, I've seen a lot. I grew up in music, and he, he is phenomenal. But he is really quick to deflect the credit to the kids. His, his statement is, the kids put in the work, and it's true. And, and we also know that Heath provides the support. Um, he has an uncanny ability to unleash students' potential, um, especially in music. And he provides them with the opportunities to achieve uh, at high levels. And so we appreciate him. We appreciate the students of the jazz band and for uh, the, the, the recognition that they provide to Farmington Junior and to Davis School District on a national level. And so we, we appreciate him so much. Now you can introduce who's here with you. Uh, I have my wife with me, Christine Wolf, who is the teacher at Central Davis Junior High, and my better half. So um, do I have to say more? Um, <laughs> Well, the kids, the kids deserve the credit. They, they, they deserve the credit. Um, you can't do anything if the, if the students don't do what you ask them to do, and they do. They work hard. Um, they listen. They're teachable. Uh, they're, they're fallible. They make tons of mistakes, but we learn from them. We're not afraid to fail. Uh, we fail a lot, but we learn from that, and we become stronger. Um, so, yeah, the successes are theirs. I get way too much credit for what the kids do, way too much. They do the work and can't do it without an amazing administration and parents in the community. Um, just, it just, it's a really good combination. So I thank you. I appreciate the recognition. I wish my kids could be up here instead <laughs> of me because, yeah, they're the ones who deserve it. But thank you very much. So. <clears throat> President, uh, Mr. Hill, if I could, you know, I. Mr. Wolf is such a great uh, asset to the school district. Um, you know, I've been in his class multiple times, and I can, if I could paint, I could paint a picture of how I'm going to see him every time, because he's up in front, and he has the same uh, intense teaching uh, about excellence every time. And, it, and it's funny because you go in and sometimes, you know, there, that intensity can overwhelm kids, particularly young kids. And uh, in Mr. Wolf's class, I always get a kick out of when the band halts and they're halting to his direction. And, uh, but they always know he loves them. And they, they, can use humor when appropriate, and they know when to snap back on task. And, uh, you know, we're so lucky to have teachers like Mr. Wolf and Ms. Wolf, uh, Ms. Bradbury, uh, that can show kids their potential uh, and exceed their potential uh, through the performing arts, because it is valuable. Uh, you know, I love watching kids in band hold their instruments because, you know, they vary in shininess, cleanliness, uh, dance, 
uh, and I always get a kick out of that, but they all sound great when Mr. Wolf's uh, leading them, and uh, we appreciate it. Sometimes. <laughs> Every time I've been there, so thank you. And we have another family member in the district as well, yes. don't we? Yes, okay. yes. your daughter. Syracuse High. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, we're blessed to have all of you. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Eckersley and Superintendent Newey have a plaque for you, Wolf, or Heath. Excuse me. Thank you, Heath. We'll move to our public comment period at, at this point. If I could cover just a few things relative to um, the uh, rules that we'd like our presenters to follow. First of all, uh, we have set aside 18 minutes total with individual presentations limited to three. Ms. Hansen to my left again has um, an alarm that will go off at three minutes and we would ask you at that point in time to stop so that we can invite our next presenter to the podium. Our public comment period is reserved for speakers who reside within Davis School District unless otherwise noted by the presiding board member. Uh, if you would, when you come, if you would just, again, pro provide the name and topic you wish to address before you begin your presentation. Uh, the public comment period shall not be used to air complaints concerning bidding, contracts, employment, or personnel issues, to criticize or defame district employees or board members, or to make complaints for which other avenues for appeal exist. Person speaking shall direct comments to the presiding board member. Members of the board and the superintendent may ask questions of any person who addresses the board only upon approval from the presiding board member. And finally, the board is unable by law to deliberate or take action on items raised during the public comment period that is not otherwise on the board agenda. Our first public comment, um, is it Beth? from Adams? Okay. Mr. Robinson, Mr. Newey, and board members, thank you for your time. Can you pull Can that you, microphone yeah. down? That's just a little, please. There you go. My name is Beth Palmer. I'm a retired speech language pathologist from the district. I am here in response to some comments made during uh, the September meetings. Uh, during that, during those meetings, several parents were advocating for their transgender children to be able to choose and use the pronouns they identify with instead of the pronouns connected to their biological gender in the classroom. I appreciate parents advocating for their children. My concern is having children in the classroom using pronouns of their choosing and how that would impact children who are second language learners language impaired or those students who in general struggle with understanding and using English grammar. In Utah, we have six to 10% of our student population who are English language learners. Another 12% of our population are, receive, are receiving some level of special education support and all children 
of all students of varying abilities are working on acquiring and using the English language in all grades. Those with language learning difficulty take considerably longer to understand as well as apply language and its rules. Adequate grammar development impacts the student's spoken, written language as well as reading comprehension. If you allow for confusing <coughs> pronoun use in the classroom, that can be a detriment for those students who are struggling with language learning. For those who are proficient in the understanding and use of the English language, pronoun choice may seem like an, ex an insignificant issue. Unfortunately for those who have struggled with language acquisition, pronouns can be difficult for those to understand and apply and can remain so for an extended period. These demands for language, the demands for language acquisition and use increase every year. For those who have difficulty with language learning, they are at a significant disadvantage. The, con the classroom should support language learning and not make it more confusing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Nate Affleck. Nate Affleck, I'm here in regards to test to stay. Um, I had a ordeal with my child at Buffalo Point this week, and it was not a good experience in the least. And um, I want to read something first, and I'll kind of tell that story a little bit. When any school initiates a test to stay program, participation in testing by law is voluntary and is not a condition for eligibility to receive in-person learning. Currently, the school, any school, is in violation of the Utah state law by demanding that parents who refuse consent to have their children participate in COVID testing stay home for 10 days. Mind you, we're using a test that the CDC has blatantly said does not work, that is, gives tons of false positives, but somehow we're still relying on that test as our benchmark gold standard, which to me, I still don't understand why we're using that test. If they admit themselves, it's faulty and it gives false positives. So now we're testing perfectly healthy children as if they're lepers. And if they refuse the test, they, oh, they're a leper. We gotta stick them away, we can't let them come. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't know how we've got to this point in our society, but I feel like we live in a crazy world most days. Everyone I talk to thinks the same thing, and here we are, we just continue to do it. There is no provision in the code to allow a school to deny in-person learning to students whose parents do not provide consent for their children to participate in COVID-19 testing under a test to stay event. This was explicitly upheld by the lawsuit filed earlier this year against the test to stay program McClure versus Richard Saunders, which is basically the state school board, the Summit County board, the um, health departments. It's a, it's a number of people that was against. That was who the defendants were. This was, uh, this was precisely the point of the dispute of the lawsuit. Can children whose parents assert their legally protected right to direct the medical decisions of their children and deny consent to participate in testing during a test to stay event be denied in person learning? The answer is no. The school, the health department, nor the governor can read powers into the legislation that are not explicitly delineated. The language of the code must be taken as written. There is no language in the code that states the children whose parents do not provide consent for them to participate in the test to stay event must quarantine or go into remote learning. This was upheld by McClure versus Saunders. The school has no authority, any school has no authority to create such a provision. What I ask is this, I am requesting- That's your three minutes, Mr. Affleck, if you could summarize quickly. This is it, yeah. I'm requesting that we make it clear to our parent community that only those parents who wish to have their children participate in COVID testing. I'm gonna ask you to stop at that point. We're gonna have Ms. Daly come to the stand, please.
Good evening, board members. I was excited to see that the public comment policy was on the agenda tonight. Um, and I looked at the proposed amendments and I have a few concerns about them and I would just like to make you aware of a few things, of a few of my thoughts for consideration. So the proposal um, is a proposed increase of overall time to 20 minutes um, from 18 minutes um, and then decreasing individual allotment from three minutes to two minutes, which would increase um, the number of participants being able to provide public comment from six during a meeting to 10, but then it also removes the public comment from workshop meetings. So now, instead of the board being able to benefit from hearing from 12 public comments in a month, which I don't really feel like is adequate, um, it goes down to 10 a month. That is the opposite direction that we want to be going and doesn't address the community's needs. Um, I had the privilege of attending the Board and Labor Interim Committee meeting yesterday. It was phenomenal and filled my heart with so much pride for Utah. I don't care what side you were on. It was incredible to have 600 to 700 people in person on that Capitol Hill. We had to be dispersed among three buildings because that's how many people were there. It was amazing. And they let everybody who wanted to speak, speak. And it was a civil discussion. And that has been the theme. If people are given a chance to be heard, things stay calm. If they feel like they cannot reach the people that they have elected to represent them, pressure builds up. It's a very simple, simple answer. Either let everybody who takes time out of their day feel respected and be heard or find a way to let them acknowledge what side of a very uh, controversial issue they're on by a raise of hands, by something, by taking I don't, by taking a vote, I don't know, a vote. That's an inappropriate suggestion. But my point is, um, please respect the time citizens sacrifice to be part of the governmental process. This is so important, and I'm so excited to see the community rallying around being involved in the government process, and I would love to see that be a collaborative effort by those that we elect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daly. Uh, Jeremy? Hello, I'm a parent of children in the Davis School District. I'm also, I would like to, to comment on the amendments to the public comment policy, and I'd like to echo the previous comments of the, uh, of the parent that came before me. Um, if we just think about it, let's do some math. So I understand there's around 72,000 students in the Davis School District, something around there. Let's just say, uh, on average, parents have three to four kids in this school district, uh, two parents per household. That would give me math of, say, around 40,000, roughly 40,000 parents. And what this amendment would do, as the previous speaker just observed, is it would increase just 10 speakers per meeting. And that's 120 per year, if you presume you have one every month. So 120 potential voices out of 40,000. So I just, uh, as she pointed out, that creates an incredible bottleneck. And no doubt you're very acutely aware of um, the National School, Bo um, School Boards Association comments last week uh, suggesting that uh, some of these heated discussions at the school boards were on the par of an immediate threat and um, even um, domestic terrorism and hate crime. We don't need that kind of you know, hyperbolic political propaganda um, and uh, that all it does is add fuel to this whole situation. And if you can imagine as a parent, uh, many are just awakening to how, how, how little control they have over their children's education. Uh, basically, we have three avenues to be able to, to make our voices heard, despite paying out and paying for all of this uh, through our property taxes and our state taxes. We have three, three avenues. One, that's to elect or remove each one of you. Uh, we have the ability to volunteer at our local schools, which is extremely productive. And then we have this, right? We have our two or three minutes, which a buzzer goes off, and then we're, we're um, sometimes unceremoniously cut off in mid-sentence. So you can imagine uh, if you find out there are all kinds of things going on in your, in your child's curriculum or in the budget or in personnel issues that you have almost no influence over, you can imagine a, a high degree of frustration. And um, adding two minutes to the public comment agenda, frankly, is quite, quite embarrassing. I mean, I would expect a little bit better proposal 
um, something on the order of maybe even twice a year that your entire meeting is nothing but public comment. Um, if you want to diffuse all this tension, which your national association is suggesting is such a threat, well, then you need to have a remedy that's equivalent to that uh, and that actually addresses and remedies that situation and that, that incredible bottleneck of emotion. Um, uh, we are entrusting quite a bit to you, uh, our children, every day, several hours a day, uh, and it's pretty much a black box. If you're not there volunteering every day, you don't really know what's going on. And it's, it's quite a shock to find out some of these political agendas that are filtering through all the way down to our children's elementary schools. So um, again, uh, just to, be, uh, to sum this up, I would recommend a, a quite a different remedy than adding two minutes to this uh, every, every, every month. Thank you. Thank you. We have two other slots that haven't been filled. Is there anybody here that would like to make a public comment that did not sign up? Thank you. We're going to move to our information items. We're President Robison, there yes. was a hand on the front row. I did not see it. I, I need you to state your name and also the city you live in. Hey, my name is David Gallegos. I live in Clinton uh, in Davis County. And uh, I just wanted to say a couple things. Like, I appreciate it. I was here last meeting you had, and I appreciated that you guys uh, kind of stood up for the not having any flags or any political propaganda in the classrooms. I kind of feel like that that was a good call for the neutral area for all of the kids to be and to not have to lean one way or the other. Like, and I'm, I'm not saying that I, I feel whichever way I feel about it, but it's just better that they go to school to learn and not have to worry about that kind of stuff. But uh, um, I was a little concerned about the, the time periods too being that sometimes it seems like the three minutes is a little short. And I know you want to try and hear as many people as you can, like, you know, different opinions and stuff. And sometimes it gets a little off track. But I think that the longer time is better. And I, I don't know if it's uh, for us to be able to find a way, because are we supposed to get a hold of one of you guys personally beforehand if we have any complaints and not really just bring them here? Or I'm not 100% not sure how that's supposed to work. Like, because if there's a person that kind of represents the district that we're at and that maybe if there was some instruction on there or do I just ask someone out here to help me out with a with a number I might be able to so I could if I have a problem or a question I can reach out to one of you that might be over that before it comes to one of these forums well a quick answer to your question um, is any board member can receive an email as well as any staff member in this in the superintendency and is that usually the way to do it, or is, is phone call an option to? Uh, all, all, I think all of our numbers are listed. Okay. All right, and that, that's pretty much it. I just kind of felt like I want to address really last week. I, I appreciated that coming through. I was just kind of watching, and so thank okay, you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Glegos. Good. All right, now we'll move to the information items. Committee reports, we're going to start with Ms. Mumford, who is going to cover our information tonight regarding the foundation, Ms. Mumford? Correct. It's my privilege tonight just to mention a few great things happening in our district on behalf of Ms. Stevenson, who's not able to attend. She does a really excellent job representing our foundation, which is the nonprofit part of our district that works on community sponsors and, and nonprofit donations that benefit our students. So first, we wanted to recognize Young Kia. They conducted their Stuff the Bus event on September 11th, thousands of school supplies were donated to Head Start and there was a morning full of games, pizza, fun, balloons and then they also contributed $10,000 to the foundation so that will help students all year long. Along with that on September 11th approximately 32 different community and ecclesiastical groups in Davis and Morgan counties used that as a day of service to give back to our students. Um, we received 16,000 pantry packs, 1,500 grab-and-go bags, 3,000 hygiene kits, 2,500 backpacks, and 100 diaper bags for the Young Parents Program, and thousands of school supplies. Um, over $100,000 of resources were donated because of that project. So a huge thank you to, that was just really the whole community that stepped up on that day of service and benefited students. Um, the foundation conducted their golf classic in September on the 13th and $57,000 was raised that day with generous sponsorship by Hogan Construction, who was the title sponsor, and that will enhance teacher experiences and classroom opportunities all year long as teachers apply for those grants. 
And then last of all, the foundation was a partner in the Davis Dash and Bash, and that's a wellness event for our employees, and that was on September 18th with a fun, fun run. And then also special thanks to Lakeview Hospital, who sponsored that, and Troy Wood, their CEO, provide some, provided some of the musical entertainment. So we appreciate Lakeview and Kimberly Johnson in our wellness department for her work on that. So thank you to our foundation and all the people who are partner with us to make those events possible. Thank you, Ms. Mumford. Turn some time to Ms. Gerard for USBA. Thank you. Um, we do want to say thank you to everyone who attended our region meeting. Um, it was nice to be able to meet with our board here right in our own room, and it was just um, great to be able to meet with um, school board members from throughout the state and receive feedback and to have time to collaborate a little bit. Um, the USBA annual conference, as you already know, will be held January 6th through the 8th, Eighth at the Little America Hotel, and um, districts will be see receiving that information October 15th. So that will be coming out. Um, so watch for that. Um, that will come out shortly after that. It'll come to our district first, and then they'll get it out to us. Um, the proposed bylaws changes will be voted on January 6th, and a new USBA vice president will be elected um, from a multi-region district. And I was just going to mention too, we had we had um, excellent attendance at our region meetings. We were missing a few, but to overall very good attendance. Um, the decision has been made for the JLC Legislative Committee um, Joint Legislative Committee will be held at the Granite School District this year instead of at the Capitol. And there's many reasons for that. You can ask me if if you're wanting to know. Um, the NSBA conference will be held in San Diego, April 2nd through the 4th, so looking forward to that. And um, I have already uh, mentioned to you that uh, you did receive a copy of the letter, and uh, it was mentioned tonight that NSBA sent to President Biden. Um, the USBA Master Boards Award will now have a new name, and it will be called the Master Board Certification and um, be a little more public facing. Um, boards who have a majority who have received that certification uh, status will be now listed on a public page and um, that website and page is being worked on. Um, last year, um, our Davis School Board achieved that status at, as a master board certified board by having um, a majority of our board achieve those goals. And um, just wanted to remind you that the deadline for that is December 1st, and our, our excellent representative is Cheryl Phipps, and I'm sure she's going to be calling you and reminding you about that deadline that's coming up. So thank you, Cheryl. Um, lastly, mark your calendars for February 22nd, and that's USBA Day on the Hill. More details will be coming, but that's going to be um, a little bit different than it has been the past few years. But plan on having breakfast with our legislators there, and then um, district students will be invited to come at around 11, 11 a.m. to perform musical numbers um, on that day. So that's it. Thank you, Ms. Gerard. Mm -hmm. Superintendent, mm -hmm. we'll turn the time to you for the superintendent's report. Thank you, President Board. Uh, just a few things wanted to make note of and then turn some time to Mr. Zerbakken for a, a special presentation. Uh, first of all, um, we want to recognize each, each uh, month, twice a month, you're aware board that uh, we visit schools. And each month uh, or each visit, a uh, staff member is recognized. And we want to recognize uh, at Burton Elementary, Monica Cox, the board recognized uh, her for her work at Burton, and then also Katrina McFeeters at uh, Holbrook Elementary was honored this past uh, cycle of, of visits. We want to recognize those two great teachers for their work that they've done in those schools. Also, uh, two of our Sea Perch teams from Sunset Elementary placed in the 2021 Sea Perch International Challenge, uh, that, that takes place up at Weaver State at their pool. Um, and uh, PHG, PHG receives second place, and Team Eat My Bubbles 3.0 <laughs> receives third place. So we're uh, happy for 
both of those. We don't know what PHG stands for, <laughs> but eat my bubbles is clear. Um, <laughs> also, three elementary students from Syracuse Elementary won awards at the 14th Annual Chinese Bridge competition, uh, though that's a worldwide Chinese speaking and performance competition. Allison Holt, sixth grade, um, from Syracuse Elementary, took first place in the competition for primary school students. Emily Holt received a special honorary award and Emmy Nelson was given an award of excellence. So congratulations to those three students. Also sixth grader Kellen Gold, a, Stuel, a Stewart Elementary uh, chess club player, was honored as the best elementary chess player in Utah at the Rockefeller Chess Tournament and traveled to New Jersey to represent the state of Utah where he tied for 13th place against representatives from 50 states. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, there's been uh, kind of a revitalization of chess the past few years, and we're certainly proud of Kellen. So uh, great job to, to him in, in the competition. Want to recognize Dr. Ryan Hansen. Uh, he's here tonight, and we know Dr. Hansen is our uh, digital uh, teaching and learning uh, director. Um, he serves as the Davis Chamber of Commerce, Commerce Legislative Chair. And we appreciate his work with the Education Committee Chair uh, position um, board. And, and that's a good uh, thing to know as we head into the legislative session. If you have anything, uh, questions, Dr. Hansen is on top of it. I saw his work. He conducted a Zoom meeting today with all of our partners. Uh, Davis Tech, Weber State is involved in that and uh, just does an outstanding job. So uh, thank you, Dr. Hansen, for your work there. Well, I got, received a notification in the mail. Uh, Doug Young of Northridge High School is, uh, actually Doug is uh, of Woods Cross, I believe, and he's serving as the president-elect of the Health Science Division of Utah UACTI. Uh, uh, where's Mr. Tanner? Mr. Tanner is... Uh, he's stepped out for a moment, but I, I believe Doug is actually at he's Woods, at Woods Cross. Cross. That's yes, correct. Yeah, uh, Doug would participate in our Principal Academy. As a side note, he's uh, uh, patented a uh, artificial intelligent virtual reality goggles that uh, perform CPR, and just a phenomenal opportunity for students and, and staff alike. Janice Killian, also uh, one of our Bountiful High School CTE coordinators, is serving as the president of the Work-Based Learning Division of Utah. They call it UACTI. It's the Utah Association of Career and Technical Education Teachers. So we're uh, grateful to have that representation. Also, board, as you know, uh, we have been uh, 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 petitioned and, and asked to join uh, with other districts in the lawsuit against Jewel Vaping Company uh, that uh, uh, a firm ha has been selected and has uh, uh, chosen as representation for a group of school districts uh, to join in that lawsuit and we will be as a district uh, joining in that with other districts uh, uh, throughout Utah. So look forward to that, another opportunity to curb the, the vaping epidemic that uh, a lot of our students participate in. With that, I want to ask Mr. Zerbakken to come to uh, the microphone uh, and introduce uh, one, of our, uh, one of our great uh, nursing employees that is uh, just, we're so thrilled to, I don't want to steal all of his thunder, so I'll stop there, John. Go ahead. Thank you, Superintendent, Mr. Board President. It's my pleasure to introduce our new coordinator of Health and Nursing Services. But before I do, just to put in context, we know that nursing services has changed significantly during the pandemic. And when Margot Hill decided to retire, there's always that, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Well, it shows the quality of people that we have in our own ranks. Because it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Jen Nielsen, who is our new coordinator, Jen, if, as you're coming forward. Jen's an almost 20 year uh, veteran nurse, 10 years here in the, in the district, uh, almost nine years at the VA. 
She is a Ute. She got her uh, nursing degree. <laughs> Mr. Carter, just uh, want to show you what real goodness is. Um, and I, and, and I just and I can say about Jen, she stepped into a very difficult job in a very difficult time. Um, in her first five weeks, she's conducted with her nursing staff three tests of stay events that have, have went marvelously under her leadership. Um, and she has continued not only to keep the ship moving forward, but to keep it moving forward at an even keel. And we couldn't be more proud and happy to have Jen as our coordinator. We're just great to have you. And I did tell her it was her opportunity to speak. So Jen, this is all <laughs> yours. If you want to introduce folks you got with you. Thank you, yes. Um, President Robison, members of the board, superintendency, uh, thank you for inviting me here. I brought my husband, Chad Nielsen, and um, my supervisor, Scott Zigich, is also here. Um, I just want to say I'm proud to represent the nursing department. We truly have an incredible team of nurses who are working really hard and diligently to keep students safe and healthy and in school. I just wanted to read, um, President Theodore Roosevelt said, the great prize of life is to work hard at something that is truly worth doing. And as school nurses, we think our work here is truly worth doing, and we're proud to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're grateful to have you in that position, Jen. We know that, um, that that's a very, very difficult position, but you are well qualified and uh, you're doing a great job. We'll continue. Thank you very much. And thank you to your, hu to your husband for your support as well. We appreciate it. Board, we're going to move to the consent items. And um, I, I need to make one correction. I gave each of you a revised set of minutes from the September 21st uh, board workshop. I think each of you received that copy with a little bit of clarification on um, an individual that presented in our public comments. And for Ms. Stevenson and Ms. Uh, Tanner, when uh, you're back with us, I will make sure you have a copy of that as well. Are there any other consent items that need clarification from any board member or would you like any of those moved to a board agenda item? If I, not, oh, sorry ahead. to jump ahead. I move that we accept consent items one through three with the amended minutes as presented by President Robinson. I'll second that. So motion by Ms. Mumford, second by Ms. Gerard, is to approve mm -hmm. consent items one, two, and three with the uh, amendment spoken of on the September 21st board workshop. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That motion passes. Thank you. We'll move to our business items. Um, you might, again, those of you that are um, with us regularly, our two student board members, uh, Kaylee Cardenas and Trevor Nelson, had conflicts this evening with the school, and we um, will penalize them for not being here, but we want to excuse them as well this evening. Board, let's look at the board calendar. Is, is there any um, clarification changes to the board calendar for October, November, December? A motion to approve the board calendar, please. I'll make a motion to approve the board calendar as presented. Second. Motion by Ms. Gerard, second by Ms. Phipps to approve the board calendar. Um, any discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That motion, pa that motion passes as well. I thought I heard a little. Yeah, Ms. Tanner, thank you very much. <laughs> Item number two is a revi revised 2021-2022 Curriculum Review Committee. Dr. Toon, I invite you to take care of that if you would please. Thank you, President Robinson and board members. In your last uh, business meeting, you approved the proposed uh, Human Sexuality Curriculum Review Committee for the current school year. And during that uh, discussion, there were some questions asked about the process for appointing individuals, particularly parents, who by our administrative procedures, which were recently implemented and passed, um, half of our parents are appointed by a lottery on that committee. Um, we were looking at the new members and realized at the time that the, 
the new committee that we brought to you last month was actually appointed under our previous procedures. So we reached out to those committee members, made the necessary corrections, and then the revised committee is before you that is in, that is in accordance with our new procedures. As a reminder, we have um, four uh, staff members, uh, Dr. Best, the Healthy, Healthy Lifestyle Director, uh, Ms. Nielsen, our <coughs> school nursing director who you just met, they're standing members of the committee and then two health teachers who serve on the committee for a period of two years. There are three parents who are appointed by school administrative appointment processes, one from the north, central, and the south. They serve a period of two years and three parents are selected by a random lottery for a period of two years. This last most recent round um, was a administrative appointment round and so the forthcoming summer we'll have the first um, uh, random lottery selection of those three parents on that committee. Um, there are a couple of just existing members on the committee who still need to finish out their terms and so there will be a few, I think there's one position will be appointed as a one year only position to get us back on the rotation mm -hmm. for our new procedures. So with that explanation and maybe a belated response to the question that was asked in our last board meeting, um, our hope is that you would entertain a motion to approve the revised and final Human Sexuality Curriculum Review Committee for the current school year. Mm -hmm. I'll move that we approve the Human Sexuality Curriculum Review Committee with the revisions presented by Dr. Toon for the 2021-2022 school year. Second. Motion by Ms. Mumford, second by Mr. Eckersley is to approve the revised uh, Human Sexuality Curriculum Review Committee for the school year 2021-2022. Discussion on that motion? Ms. Tanner? Yes. So the um, previous committee that we approved last month had eight parents and four employees. And now this new <clears throat> committee that we're asked to approve has six parents and four employees. I'm just wondering why, I guess, are the new procedures saying that now from now going forward we're only going to have six parents am i understanding that correctly president Robinson, do you like me to answer that yeah yeah uh thank you miss tanner the um the committee who worked on the policy review uh documents throughout the periods from march through i think july when we adopted those worked through this in the administrative procedures manual and that a procedures document does have six parents as the number. The state law requires an equal number of parents and um, educators. And so the former committee of eight was based on previous procedures that were prior to the approval of the new document. Yeah, so just having been, you know, remembering several years ago, there was a uh, sense from parents and the community and the board that there needed to be more parents and so back in that time we asked that more parents be added to the committee and that's why there were eight parents and four employees I mean I know I know that procedure those procedures are in place now but somehow I missed that I, that I would like to keep it at eight parents and not reduce the number of parents on the committee. Well, a reminder, and I think Dr. Toon just mentioned this, that the state law only requires us to have four. We have to have the same number as we have staff members. And that was in, in existence until, as you just referenced, Ms. Tanner, that there, were, there was a time where we uh, entertained um, the idea of expanding that by double the number of parents. But personally, I still, th I think we're in, in excellent shape with six parents on the committee, two more than we have staff members. Uh, there's good representation. There's, there's two of the six parents from the north, two from the central, and two from the south. So there, there's a balance not only of, of uh, people that are chosen there by lottery, who, who uh, put their name in and are chosen by lottery, but also, as he indicated, the administrative <coughs> approval. Um, and so I, I think it has to be looked at from two different perspectives. The perspective of the, of the district and the perspective of the, of the parents, and there has to be voices for both. 
you know, because in, in what, what the staff members can bring, the health teachers, Ms. Nielsen and Mr. Best, needs to be taken into consideration with what the parents feel are the needs of the students, what is the right and wrong methods to go by in relationship to the, to the material being presented. But I, I don't, I personally think that we're in, we're in I, would, I would feel comfortable with four parents because again, we have the balance that the state has asked us to have. But I'm certainly comfortable with six. I don't know how other board members feel, if anybody would like to express. <clears throat> Gord? I just think I, I would like to just say that I would, I would also support the, the six uh, representatives from our parents being on board. I think that's a good balance and a good number to have. Ms. Mufford? Yeah, my thought is it feels, I think the clarifying the procedure was my key concern when I brought up the questions in the last meeting. It felt like there was some timing issues in selecting them, so it feels like this is refining that, so we have a really orderly transition between those parents, and there's some, you know, historical experience that carries over, and we're getting some fresh perspectives, and, and people are confident in how they're serving on this committee. So I'm comfortable with the number, just making sure that we consistently have those procedures in place and that they're well posted. That's probably my biggest concern is that that's well promoted when those opportunities come up for the lottery mm -hmm. so that we are, we're able to actively get parents in those positions. Mr. Gerard? Well, the six does give an equal number to the north, south, and middle part of our district. So two from each seems to work. Ms. Phipps? I, I guess so I can be comfortable with, um, I think it's a good idea to have um, a majority. The six, I think, is, is a good thing. And I think it just needs to, we again, after they do the work that they do, um, we still have the review of the, to the public. And, and I think that the public, the parents, still have a, a great opportunity and, and hope that they'll take advantage of that to, to be able to share any input. And I think even though they don't go to meetings regularly, that their voice is important and will be heard outside in the process of the review of the recommendations. And that's particularly true with any um, change in the maturation program or um, curriculum, you know, in the, in the eighth and the 10th grade health classes. And as a reminder, it, whenever we're adopting primary instructional materials with the, for those topics, the full board does review and approve all those according to our procedures, in addition to the committee review. Okay. Ms. Tanner, any other comments? I just feel that any type of reduction of parents on such an important committee is uh, going in the wrong direction. I would, I would um, persuade to the best of my ability to keep two extra slots for parents on there that we um, voted on several years ago. I think that's really important. Well, I think we've all had a chance to speak uh, other than Ms. Stevenson, um, but I think what we're hearing from the majority of the board is that we're comfortable with six. Thank you. Um, so we've had it, we've got a motion, mm -hmm. and we have a second. Is there any other discussion on the motion, which is to approve the revised curriculum review committee? All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So that motion passes with one descending vote. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Toon. Ms. Keller will invite you to the podium if you would please. This is in relationship to uh, the addition of three early out days to the 2021-2022 school calendar. Okay, President And this Robinson. is K through six. Uh, yes, Okay. K through six. President Robinson, members of the board, Superintendent Newley, and Mr. Carter, as chair of the calendar committee, I am here to propose the addition of three early dismissal days for elementary students in grades kindergarten through six. USBE is requiring that all kindergarten through third grade teachers be trained in letters. Our calendar was already set la last year before full details regarding the implementation of letters was communicated. Letters units, unit trainings must be scheduled as full days and October 29th, <coughs> January 18th, and March 18th were chosen as the training days for units one through three. 
These days are teacher professional development days where teachers typically have training for half the day and time during the remaining half to prepare for end of term reports and plan for the new term. The unknowns such as the intensity of the training coupled with the amount of COVID cases we have had has put a burden on teachers. In order to recover the needed planning time for teachers, the proposal of adding three early dismissal days was brought to the calendar committee, which unanimously agreed to approve. Ms. Cragen in transportation and Ms. Bradford in nutrition services also support the added days. The proposed early out days are Wednesday, October 27th, Thursday, January 13th, and Wednesday, March 16th. Principals will not plan meetings or trainings of any kind on these three days or the currently scheduled early dismissal days of October 28th, January 14th, and March 17th, all Fridays. <clears throat> all K through six teachers who are not involved in the letters trainings will be provided with a menu of Canvas courses to complete. The courses will be mandatory and personalized to accommodate all levels of teachers' Canvas competencies. Thank you. Motion to approve the addition of three early out days to the 2021-2022 school calendar K through six. Someone could make that motion. I'll make that motion. I move to uh, add three additional early out days um, for the, to our calendar. I'll second that. Motion by Ms. Phipps, second by Ms. Gerard is to um, approve the addition of three early out days to the 2021-2022 school calendar for K through six students. Discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, I just had a comment. I'm sorry, go ahead Ms. Tanner. Yeah, I was, I'm on the calendar committee and I attended that meeting and I asked uh, the parents on the Zoom meeting, if what their uh, feeling was about that, and I think only one spoke up, and they said that it was hard on parents, you know, adding this extra time off. But that, in spite of that, they were supportive of the teachers having this time to be able to do their training and and prepare for grades so it is it, this is a sacrifice on parents part to to support this any other comments discussion Ms. Gerard I was just curious how many parents do we have on the calendar committee do you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard question hard to <laughs> well to be to be honest I just barely was made the chair yes and yes I that might don't be a hard know, question and I'm embarrassed to say that that's I okay know. I shouldn't have thrown that out and surprised okay. you with that I, I just was curious Miss Tanner might be able to speak to it. I know when yeah. I served on the committee last year there were usually at least like six parents not all attended every meeting but everybody gave input through email and there's probably more than that yeah that I, weren't I thought as there were active I don't know Miss Tanner if you do you know noticed on the Zoom call this I year. Don't, I, I, I have not been given a list of those that are on the committee. My thought is I appreciate that you did ask on the Zoom call how parents felt about it. I think recognizing that it's it's kind of a, a response to the situation we're in. You know, we made the decision a couple years ago to reduce some of those early out times with our conference weeks because we recognize the challenge that is for families and the loss of instructional mm -hmm. time for children. So mm -hmm. I think understanding that it's not a long-term change, but it's in response to an imminent situation, it, we will have to work with it, so. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate Any other discussion? Well, one thing, President and Board, appreciate the, the comments and, and speaking to the letters training, it's, it's significant. And uh, I, I think statewide, you know, as uh, we interact with other districts, and it, it's been a burden, a, a good burden, but it's still a burden. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's significant enough. It's, it's basically an endorsement for teachers, the, the amount of training. So we appreciate the, the consideration of the calendar committee. Thank you. So the motion, again, uh, board, is to approve the addition of three early out days to the 2021-22 school calendar K through six. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 
That motion passes. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Carter, do you have Ms. Stevenson on? Tim, you've got her? Okay. Mr. Carter, let's turn the time over to you. Turn the time to you for bountiful land purchase item. Thank you, President. Um, as was uh, noted in your packet, we have an opportunity to buy a little over an acre um, adjacent to bountiful or bountiful elementary property. Um, enclosed in your packet was a site plan that shows that acre. Um, this will be absolutely critical for the rebuild of that school when that takes place because it'll not only provides more land on, a, on, a, on an already small site, but it will provide access to 200 West for the, for the rebuild of the school. And so it's our recommendation uh, tonight uh, for the board to approve this purchase from the Jones family for the amount of $550,000. I move that we accept <coughs> the purchase of l land next to Bountiful elementary 1.06 acres at the price of $550,000. I'll second that, that's Marie. Motion by Mr. Eckersley, second by Ms. Stevenson to approve the purchase of the uh, Bountiful Land purchase uh, for the total of $550,000. Are there any, any discussion on that motion? Just could you describe the property a little more, Mr. Carter? Sure. In the description on the disclosure agreement, it mentioned that there was a, a home on the property, but I didn't see that in the aerial photo. It, it's a, it's a just off of 200 West, kind of under the trees. Oh, okay. So it doesn't show in that, in that site plan. Um, and so the family would, it's the family home, and they would like to be able to salvage whatever they'd like from the, from the home before we take it down, but that's, that's where it's at. Okay, so timeline, they'd have access to that until the, the point where we're ready to right. make a changes on the property. Any other discussion? Again, board, the motion is to approve the Bountiful Land Purchase uh, next to Bountiful Elementary for the price of $550,000. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> A motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Onofrio, we're going to invite you to the stand. I want to bring your chair. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, policy 5S-001, <coughs> enrollment options for students. This is a second and final reading. Thank you, President. Uh, the board will remember that we did a pair of, of uh, policies last month where we did our first reading. This is the enrollment piece of our ninth grade participation uh, play up change. And this just makes the ninth grade participation that we'll talk about next possible through the enrollment piece. Uh, we recommend that you pass it on final reading. I move that, <coughs> move that we pass um, 5S-001 enrollment options for students on uh, First and final reading? Second. Second and second reading, okay. I'll second that motion. Motion by Mr. Eckersley, second by Ms. Mumford is to approve policy 5S-001, enrollment options for students on a second and final reading. Discussion to that motion? Ms. Tanner? Just a, yeah, just a question for um, Ms. Stavros. Just as far as the combined feedback that you got on that um, policy change, was it mostly supportive, mostly uh, negative, or what was the feedback like? I'm afraid Ms. Stavros isn't here tonight, Ms. Tanner. Can I speak to that, President Robinson? I, sure. I read all the emails yeah. that Ms. Stavros forwarded. I think that mm -hmm. brings up a really important point in light of what we're talking about with public comment is mm -hmm. we did receive feedback on those policies, mm -hmm. and that's another really great avenue. Public meeting is not the only place mm -hmm. for people to make comment. Overwhelmingly, the, they were in support of the policy. There were a couple that highlighted issues to be aware of, maybe for training with athletic directors or coaches to ensure that recruiting doesn't become an issue, but all the overwhelmingly were supportive of the policy change. Mm -hmm. Yes, I read those as well, yeah. so I do uh, appreciate what you said, Ms. Mumford. Other discussion? 
So, board, the, the uh, motion is to approve 5S-001 enrollment option for students on a second and final reading. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Nay. That motion passes with one dissenting vote. Mr. Onofrio, let's go to 5S-201, ninth grade participation in Utah High School Activities Association Sports and Activities. This also is a second and final reading. Thank you, President. Uh, like I said, this is the substantive piece of this, which would allow you know, the kind of the parent choice initiative of where and when to play up uh, to be possible. We, it hasn't had any changes, changes since our last meeting. We, we recommend that it's been, it be passed by the board. I'll make a motion. I'll move that we approve um, the new policy 5S-201 ninth grade student partici participation um, on the final reading. Second. Motion by Ms. Gerard, second by Mr. Eckersley is to approve policy 5S-201 ninth grade participation in Utah High School Activity Association Sports and Activities on a second and final reading. Discussion to that motion? Ms. Phipps? I expressed um, my concerns and my vote on against the first one was related and mostly um, because I realized the first one um, leads to the second one. Um, I just want to speak um, again. I think I shared my feelings um, when we did this on the first reading of my concerns um, have to do with equity and I think that sometimes when a person talks about equity that there might be some misunderstanding of exactly um, where equity might go. Um, in my concern for this is um, it was said that um, people will go, um, people are looking and they get ways around the rule to go where they're wanting to go anyway and, and so it's not an equity thing because Sometimes uh, the families that can least afford it then can't make that choice and others can rent apartments in areas and do things to get around the rules. And um, it makes me sad that anything that would even appear that what we're doing is making, so that because people have been breaking the rules to do things um, that, that will change the rule because others have done that. Um, my equity concern is actually something I, I brought my senior high school yearbook it's pretty old um, and the same age as Clearfield High I learned uh, or the person who graduated from there the equity issue has to do with the girl who received this yearbook and that's myself because um, I was a person that that um, participated if you looked in my yearbook you would see just about every activity that was available at my school whether it was music choir um, choir band jazz band uh, theater every sport at that at that time was available to girls and that was just after title nine became a part of things and so there were very few sport choices offered to me as a girl um, lots of clubs and I did them all um, because I needed something besides an academic world I really believe in high school activities I I did serve for six years on Utah High School Activities Association and a person could look at me and think <coughs> her on high school activities I am committed to the importance and the value of high school athletics and music and, and theater um, in our schools I believe there's such huge value to um, the uh, whole child and, and educating the whole child and and that but we have children that are at risk and not just because of of, of, um, of poverty or, or language or anything like that but for some um, it's an outlet that academics and I was I received a scholarship and and um, and but it, those activities were um, the the thing that was a release for me um, from the academics and so I threw myself into that and and um, my concern with this of where I see the equity problem is that uh, in my school because my graduating class was just over 200. <coughs> Um, which is, you know, a quarter of many of the high school graduating classes. I'm concerned that 
by opening it up so that we can load schools, especially with athletes from um, that can come wherever they feel their best advantage is to play sports. What that does especially is we move more ninth graders into schools to participate that what that does is exclude in many cases seniors that that um, might be not making the team and so um, if our if our programs were more intramural where opportunities were there for all children to participate then I would feel better about this but I, I feel that that what we do in many cases and and I have a second generation that was cut from um, an athletic team that she'd participated in for three years in her senior year, she was cut because just before that, I as a board member um, participated in opening um, ninth graders to participate in high school athletics and, um, and all of the seniors of my daughter's soccer team were cut that year and, and, and freshmen were put on in their place and they did become state champions two years later because of a team that was built that way. I believe that high school activities are so important and are, are a value to, uh, not just to, pre to um, prepare future great athletes. I think we'll have very few great athletes that will be playing in the NBA or for NFL or for any of those situations, but the value that uh, comes to students in leadership in um, just that being able to work together as teams and those things are so important that I'm concerned that in our situation that when you have the few people that can like play on a, on a high school basketball team that to be able to cause the team to possibly be that I'm a, a tenth, a, even anyone beyond the ninth grader so a ringer ninth grader makes it possible that, that somebody that's not a great basketball player doesn't have the opportunity in our, especially our very large schools to participate in basketball in an organized team sport. And that's my, my, my thoughts and why I'll be voting no, um, just because I, I am concerned in the end that um, I want our sports to be available to, to all kids and, and that the focus not get just about having um, winning teams or about uh, students that are gifted and talented in, in an athletic way. I think that there are a lot of places outside of our schools for those students also to excel in, um, in city leagues and other situations, but I'm concerned that our schools should be there so that all kids can have an opportunity to have those experiences. Ms. Gerard. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I I do understand um, some of the things that Ms. Phipps is talking about, and I feel that the original intent of the current policy that we have, um, it, it there were good intentions with it, but I I do know that um, this policy is not being followed. Um, in light of some of the discussion that's come up tonight, I have talked to many parents about this. Um, I've talked to Mr. Best about it, and I know he's talked to many parents that have felt um, that some of their choices have been curtailed by this policy. Um, and I know others feel differently, but um, as we have listened to the experts that we have in our district, um, they have felt that we'll have a little more control over the t these types of things, these situations um, that we have had in the past with um, the current policy that we have. And um, I just feel like it's time now for this change to bring us in line with the Utah High School Activities Association and with all of the other districts in the state. So I would just make a couple comments. First, when Ms. Phipps expresses the concerns that she has not only on this but and there are, have been other issues I, I have such great respect for her in regards to her uh, sincere interest in making sure that that every young man and every young woman have uh, equal opportunities and um, you know we can define the word equity in a lot of different ways but I I believe in my experience with her 
uh, that she has a sincere interest that, that this just be something that young people you know, can, can participate in, no matter what it might be, and, and grow from that participation. So my, my comments are not that I'm right and she's wrong. It's the perspective, I think, and I would maybe piggyback on a couple of things that Mr. Gerard said, but I'd ask Mr. Christensen and Mr. Layton and Mr. Astle, Dr. Best, if I say something that's incorrect, please make sure that you do correct me. But, but I, I do believe that in part of what we, what you gentlemen did and others that were involved were, uh, part of that was communication with our high school principals, junior high principals. Uh, I, I believe uh, athletic directors uh, had an opportunity to look at um, the direction that we were going. And, um, and I would say there's a lot of people statewide that would like a pure system where kids played at the school where they live. In a perfect world, that's how we would mm -hmm. do this. But there have been, um, there have been legislative laws passed that have put us in a situation educationally with open enrollment and different things that it, it has been for a number of years a difficult challenge to, to, to keep kids playing where they live. And I think as all of us know, we're the only district out of 41 that currently have a policy that says, current policy that the ninth grader can only play at his or her boundary high school. And then as a sophomore, they can try to get in our old program of variance. But in listening to Mr. Layton and Mr. Christensen, moving to our policy on enrollment and moving to the ninth grade involving Dr. Best and that uh, part of it will reduce the workload and reduce some of the anxiety, I believe, Mr. Christensen, with parents in regards to the current variance process, that this is going to be easier to manage. I think, the, uh, to me, there's no intent to load up any school. And I trust that our secondary directors, in particular, will have a, an eye on uh, what's going on, and, um, and I I'm confident that if there is a misuse of the rule with heavy recruiting and, and the loading up does begin to appear that, um, that the, the, there, there will be involvement of administration because that's not the intent. I, I think it does provide some equity. Again, my definition of equity, any kid can go play any place he or she wants to play regardless of the finances that can get them there or can you know, get, get them somehow around the rule, any kid can go anywhere as long as they can qualify for that enrollment uh, option that, we're, uh, that we've passed. Um, but I, I fought very hard to keep the current policy, but at this point in time, I, I'm a believer that this, it's time for us to move ahead and um, consider passing this new ninth grade participation policy on, on our second and final reading. Any other discussion? Ms. Mumford. I think everybody shared some really great thoughts. One thing I like to keep in mind is this policy benefits families in lots of different situations. So we've talked a lot about athletics, but the more we are moving towards personalized learning, this empowers families to make choices for their students, whether it's academic or extracurricular or athletics. So I just think it aligns really well with the work we're doing with all of our stakeholders. Any other discussion? Let me just chime in. Can you, can you hear me, John? Yes. Okay, I, I'm a holdout um, along with several of you, but I do feel it's time. Many of the things Cheryl said are great points, and I appreciate that, but um, if we played only school teams in our own district, I wouldn't see the value of this change. Being a, a parent of many athletes, I, I appreciated that they played. But now that we play, we play across the state everywhere, and because we play across district boundaries, I feel we need to move forward with this change. And since um, we're the only, or one of the holdouts in the state, I think oh, it's time we move forward. So um, I say that with grimacing, but I think it's time. 
So board, the policy 5S-2019 ninth grade participation Utah High School Activity Association sports and activities on a second and final reading. We need to vote on that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, no? No. That motion passes with one dissenting vote. Mr. Onofrio, let's go to policy 2HR-004, employee discipline and dismissal policy on a first and final reading. Thank you, President. <clears throat> there are two pieces of this. The first one is legislative. Uh, we were required by the last, last legislative session to make a change in our policy that denoted which uh, court an appeal of a, a termination would go to. Uh, it's the appeals court. And secondly, HR has been asking for a while for uh, something in our policy to cover job abandonment. Um, in some cases, when there's less adherence to um, a position, we have uh, employees who will not show up and have no uh, communication for a, a, a period of days. This would allow us after five days to consider that uh, resignation without having further uh, issues with our uh, following up. So this is on first and final. We recommend it for approval. I move that we approve. Um, 004, employee discipline and dismissal policy on first and final. Second. Motion by Ms. Stevenson, second by Ms. Phipps, is to approve 2HR-004, <coughs> employee discipline and dismissal policy on a first and final reading. Discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. We'll move to policy 3RM-100, legal defense of district employees on a first and final reading. Thank you, President. Uh, we're hitting some five-year reviews here. When we reviewed this policy, we thought we could improve it by adding the in connection with or arising out of um, language there, which basically just makes it clear that if someone were to get legal help from the district who's an employee, um, that relationship with uh, their job would have to be less incidental and more direct. Um, uh, so other than that, uh, we recommend that it pass on first and final. I'll move that we approve uh, policy 3RM-100 legal defense of district employees on first and final reading. Second. Motion by Ms. Girard, second by Mr. Eckersley to approve policy 3RM-100 legal defense of district employees on a first and final reading. Discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. That motion passes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Onofrio, let's go to policy 4I-104 charter schools on a first and final reading. Thank you, President. The board will remember about 20 years ago, the district um, uh, char uh, sponsored a charter school. And in doing so, we had to have somewhere in our policy that described that policy at least uh, somewhat. In our review of it this time, all the, the, the structure for how to, to sponsor a charter school is already in board rule and in, and in the law. And it, it's uh, kind of a cumbersome process. So we uh, recommended that we repeal this. And were the district to ever uh, need to sponsor a charter, we could just rely on what's in law and rule. I move that we um, that we approve the repeal of four I dash one hundred four charter schools on a first and final. Second, motion by Ms. Phipps, second by Mr. Eckersley, to approve policy four I dash one zero four charter schools on a first and final readings. This is a repeal of that. Correct. Yeah. Discussion on that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I'm sorry, Ms. Stevenson and Ms. Tanner, I'm a little too fast, I apologize. Uh, policy 5S-104, video surveillance of district property on a first and final reading, Mr. Onofrio. Thank you, President. Uh, this, this, again, is another five-year review. Every, every five years we go by, there's better technology and our, our systems keep getting better and better. There's been some more interest in CCTV footage uh, from time to time. This clarifies the, the more recent uh, guidance from our Family Compliance Policy Office, which administers the FERPA law, um, just making it more clear when uh, a record would be uh, a student record 
and, and whom it applies to. We uh, recommend that it pass on first and final. I move that we pass 5S-104, video surveillance of district property on first and final reading. I'll second that. Motion by Mr. Eckersley, second by Ms. Gerard is to pass um, policy 5S-104, video surveillance of district property on a first and final reading. Discussion on that motion? Just a quick question. So the current practice, it just kind of clarifies Right now, that's what would happen anyway. Like if a student were being investigated and there were other students in that video footage, the administrator would describe it and that wouldn't be released? Well, let's say, for instance, there's a fight between two students. Okay. The, the record of the CCTV is related to those two students who are combatants. Mm -hmm. But if there's not a kids around them watching, it wouldn't be related to those kids around them. Okay. So those kids around them, we wouldn't need permission for. Thank you for clarifying. Any other discussion? Motion board is to approve policy 5S-104 video surveillance of district property on first and final reading. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Um, policy 1B-030, Mr. Onorofrio, the school board meetings. This amendment comes as a result of the discussion at the board's last study session. Uh, as proposed, it would increase the amount of public comment time during business meetings from 18 to 20 minutes uh, and, and make it possible for 10 people to speak instead of six. And it would remove the public comment during the workshops. Uh, this is on first reading. We recommend that it's, it pass approval. I move that we pass on first reading 1B-030 on school board meetings, which reduces the time that uh, a person is allowed to speak to two minutes, but increases the number of persons who may speak to 10. I'll second that motion. Motion by Mr. Eckersley. Uh, second by Ms. Mumford is to approve policy 1B-030 school board meetings with the um, modification of extending 20 minutes to business meetings only and uh, two minutes per speaker, which extends to 10 speakers. Discussion on that motion? Ms. Phipps. So I, I, this has been a, a real struggle for me because um, I spent my whole adult life in as various places in PTA encouraging parents to be engaged and get their voices heard and have spent many, many, many hours at the Capitol um, visiting with legislators and advocating for children. And, um, and I'm, I'm very, I'm concerned with anything that, that has a feel of cutting off the voices of the public and, and, and those voices are important and I think they're important for us as we make good uh, decisions. And so, um, and have been having a lot of dialogue with a, a lot of various people. You know, the, the struggle we, I think is, is, is when is there enough dialogue and and when is it not and and I know earlier the the pub the the hearing that was uh, at the Capitol was was referenced and, and I think it's a it should be noted that there's a difference between the public hearings and and our public comment time because um, we'll have situations where we as a board meet and have those public hearings as well and we stay till the cows go home as well, um, and 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 there's a difference uh, of that uh, in those those particular kind of meetings, um, and and so, but when is it an appropriate amount of time? And I think the public understands the idea of about. So would we want school board meetings to last, and so, so that you know we're here till midnight taking public comment? Well, I might be willing to 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 be here, but maybe all of the public isn't willing, or maybe other board members or staff. And so it's a hard thing about what's the right balance of how many people should speak, 
and um, and what's the appropriate amount and making sure I think that um, I am um, willing to I'm glad that this is a first reading and that we're, we're not on the final vote now because I'm still in the process of thinking this through and receiving some input from other elected bodies and how they're handling it and and um, just pondering this and so um, I, I'm, I'm not fully uh, accepting of that. I, I, I do think that there's some value to have dialogue in our um, study sessions um, and, and uh, how we go about doing that. I, I still am pondering what the right way to go about doing that is and making sure that we make sure that our public really does feel that, um, that their voices are important. And I think that civil dialogue is so important and, and that's what's kind of been missing sometimes lately as it's not been just civil. And, uh, but I think the public needs to feel their voices are important and heard, um, but we work together in a partnership. And so where is that balance? And, and so I am continuing to think about that. And I'm glad that we have another reading till we do final approval of this. Other discussion? Ms. Tanner. I think public comment is a vital part of our meetings, and elected officials should be able to hear from their constituents. And in fact, even our policy states that we're accountable to the people of Davis County, and so we should be accessible to hear what they have to say. Um, Many years ago when uh, Gordon and I were elected, there was no public comment allowed in board meetings and board members were cut off from hearing what uh, the public thought, at least in public meetings. And one of the first things we did was make a public comment policy. And at that time, there were 30 minutes of public comment allowed at each meeting. Then this board changed that and went down to uh, 18 minutes at each meeting and now we're talking about instead of 36 minutes for a month now we're talking about dress you know putting it down to 20 minutes for a month and, and I don't think that I, is enough I am um, supportive of changing it to two minutes to allow 10 people to speak but I would like to keep it at both of our meetings, at the business meeting, allow public comment, and at the workshop, allow public comment. I, I just think this trend, though, is not a good trend, reducing uh, the public's voice as part of our meetings. I do think we should have um, constraints on it. I don't think that um, we should allow for public comment for hours and hours. Um, I know I did talk with Nancy Tingey from the Canyon School Board about their public comment, and she said when they have people sign up, she will look at how many have signed up, and based on that, she'll if there are a lot, she'll say, we're going to allow everybody one minute to speak. If there's a few, then they'll allow three minutes for people to speak. She will, um, based on the number who signed up, allow people to speak a certain amount of time that's flexible, but that they, they allow everyone to speak, and they really haven't had more than about 20, 30 minutes of, of public speaking time. I just, um, I read an article in the Desert News about um, public discourse and public um, conversations, just the, the whole idea of the democratic process of bringing a variety of viewpoints together, debating their merit, deciding on solutions, and taking action, and how important that is to hear these different different viewpoints that, that are shared. This is what he says at the end of it. Um, this is Justin Collins, who's a professor at BYU Law School. The survival of self-government requires that the conversation continue. We must defend in our day, the rights of all to engage in the ongoing dialogue, even if their they or their views are unpopular. 
We must collectively carry the conversation forward with unflagging civility and mutual respect, with a passionate democratic gusto, and in an invincible spirit of freedom. So I would recommend that we keep it in workshop and not eliminate that. Ms. Mumford. Yeah, I appreciate Julie's comments, and I, I, I read that same article and thought the same thing, that we as a board need to be constantly looking for ways to have that civil dialogue. One concern I have with a public comment period is I don't think it meets that need. I think um, some of the best civil dialogue I've had with constituents and patrons has been more like what Mr. Gallegos suggested where they email or call and I'm able to <laughs> help them navigate the process of working with the district or addressing an issue. So I think the discussion for me highlights that we need to communicate all these different avenues that parents have to participate in committees, to share concerns with board members directly. Um, but for me as a board member, I want to make sure that they do have those avenues, and I think public comment is one of them. But it's, it's not the only one, and I think the primary purpose of this meeting is a business meeting. The workshop has a, a separate purpose, and so my thought process as we kind of discuss this more deeply in study session was the idea of keeping workshop focused as, as an opportunity for the board to study issues more deeply and get feedback um, from the administration and have more of an open dialogue as a board. And then this public meeting is a forum where we identify a, a time for those public comments to be within the framework that we decide. So I'm, I'd prefer to keep the comments in our, in our business meeting and keep the, this, the workshops and the study sessions focused on um, board issues and district issues and it, as an opportunity for us to prepare as board members to make decisions in this business meeting. Ms. Gerard. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I, I don't want to be repetitive, but I was going to say many of the same things that Ms. Mumford talked about and it's been alluded to by uh, Ms. Phipps also that um, there are different kinds of meetings and so um, business meetings are where we make decisions and um, of course want to allow public comment there and add a few more which we're doing um, workshops um, i would like to see more of a working meeting and more discussion and feedback and getting info like Ms. mumford said uh, from the experts that we have in our district we do have those public hearings which are different and we just had one truth and taxation and we did listen to everyone that came to speak that night, and we listened for at least a couple of hours. And we've had those public hearings on boundary changes and other things that we've discussed. So we have listened to everyone that has been there. Um, and as Ms. Mumper said, we do have other, many other avenues to receive input and um, phone calls, texts, emails. We just got heard about the feedback um, on these policy changes that we got. Um, we, have, we have lots of other ways. We have the committees where we have feedback and input um, from parents on these committees. So we do have other avenues, not just public comment. And um, I do have the opportunity to work with other school board members th from throughout the state. And when I talk to them, most of them were surprised to learn that we do have public comment at our workshops. Um, I, I really didn't find um, a lot from other districts. I, I didn't talk to anyone, but I, I didn't, you know, talk to every single person from every district or even a representative from every district, but most do not have um, public comment at workshops because they use that more for a work meeting and it's a different type of meeting. Some different formats for different meetings. In the uh, research that we did, Ms. Gerard and I, we, we looked at the, or talked to the districts along the Wasatch Front. Mm -hmm. There were none of them that had it during the workshop, other than us. Ms. Tanner, I need to just clarify the, the point that you made was you would recommend we have it during workshop, but there's a motion on the floor to approve business meetings only. So, 
uh, you would have the opportunity to amend that motion if you chose to, to include workshops. Otherwise, okay. we, we vote on the motion that was made. Okay, I move that we, I make a motion that we amend the um, policy to add back or work, uh, is it and workshops or or workshops? It would be and. Or workshops. It's a substitute. So it would read Substance that motion. the board shall allow time. If this, if the amendment, the substitute amendment is accepted, then the policy would read the board shall allow time for public comment at the beginning of regularly scheduled board meetings and workshops. Sounds Correct. Good. Mr. Carter? Yep. Good with that? Yeah, so this would be a substitute motion. Substitute that you motion. Have to vote on now. Is there a second to Ms. Tanner's motion? I'll second it for discussion purposes. So we have a, a substitute motion and second um, to amend policy 1B-030 as I indicated. Discussion on the substitute motion. Ms. Phipps. So this is just, just going back to my original comment, which is I'm still trying to figure out how to do this in the right balance, and there's some feelings about what we do in workshop and whether the public can be involved in offering information as well in that. So I, so I, I guess I'm as, as I'm not sure if I'm going to be voting in the long run on the second for the policy at all. So, but uh, I'm willing to vote for this because I want uh, it, whether whether we go ahead and make that change now or, or later, it, it doesn't matter. It's all part of the discussion for me. And so I, I, I'm, I'm good with this idea. I want to pursue the idea of as much public comment and where the appropriate way is for that to happen. And we have to bear in mind we're under the direction of the open meeting laws, mm -hmm. which Mr. Onofrio um, reviews with us each year. So a big part of that discussion, uh, Mr. R's comments and your comments about more discussion I would have to be, again, legal counsel would have to help lead that discussion. But again, the open meeting it deals with things that are have been noticed and those would be agenda exactly. items. And so the public could make comments and we can can um, receive that input on, on, on the items that are on the agenda. And well, let's 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 deal with this motion now, and let's take into consideration the the concerns that you have at another time. We have the substitute motion. We need <coughs> any other discussion on that motion before we vote on that substitute motion. Miss Miss Eckersley, um, I just like to say that Mr. Uh, Eckersley, in our in our business in our workshop meetings, it is it is an open meeting because by law it has to be an open meeting. But that does not mean that we have to have public comment during that. We have, we have work to do and a lot of work to do, and it's important that we do that and that we get informed on things that are taking place in the district. Uh, for me, it just seems like public comment, which is where we're able to hear from the public maybe things that we haven't seen or haven't considered so that we can take those things into consideration. It just seems like they fit better in the business meeting than they do in the workshop meeting. And President Robinson? Yes. Well, I just want to clarify. When I was talking about discussion, I was just saying that um, I, I was talking about the format of the workshops that we usually do have. I mean, they're all open meetings, but a little more time to work through things and probably a little more discussion at those <coughs> workshops then. That's what I meant. Okay. Ms. Tanner, you had another point? Yes, I just uh, another point for having public comment also during the um, workshop so that you're doing it the first and the third Tuesday of twice a month would be the timeliness of it. Uh, a person wouldn't have to wait a month to, if they felt an issue were um, important enough to them to make a public comment about under this new proposal, they'd have to wait a month. Yeah most, whereas under our old policy, there was only a two-week 
um, wait. So it adds timeliness uh, for issues that are of an importance to our constituents. Also, another difference in that um, with public comment is that while an email is a good way to um, converse and phone calls are a great way to converse for many things, some things it's just helpful to be able to hear someone face to face and see them and it's, it's a different experience allowing them to speak personally to the board. And then also the board gets to hear it all at the same time instead of that person having to call seven different people on the board. We all hear the same message at the same time which can help communication be clearer. So those would be um, some more points for, um, I, I just don't think it's, it's I think it's worth the trade-off. I think it's worth the trade-off of our time, especially going back to our policy. We are accountable to the people of Davis County. We represent them, and and this is another way that we can hear from them. So, board, we are going to vote on the substitute motion by Miss Tanner, which again would change the reading of the paragraph under public comment period to read the board shall allow time for public comment at the beginning of regularly scheduled board meetings and workshops. So all in favor of the substitute motion to change the language and add the uh, word workshops, all in favor of the substitute motion say aye. 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 And any opposed say nay. 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 So that mo the substitute motion uh, fails on a, on a vote of five to two. We're back to the main motion of policy 1B-030, school board meetings on a first reading, uh, which again, uh, public comment will be taken on business meetings only, total of 20 minutes with each presentation um, lasting two minutes. Further discussion on the main motion, Ms. Mumford. Yeah, this is kind of a question for you, President Robinson, after chairing for the last couple of years and kind of seeing some of these different scenarios. Will you explain the opportunity if, like, say we get deluged with people next week that are worried about a vaccine mandate or some hot issue, right? What latitude does the board have to, there's a process through Robert's rules that we could change the public comment policy, if I understand it correctly. You remember back a year ago in the fall, there, the issue of hybrid or four or five day school week, and there was a, there was a, um, a lot of uh, uh, people on both sides of the issue, and we made a decision as a board the one evening to extend it to 45 minutes. So that kind of speaks to a little bit what Ms. Daly brought up. Like, as the board chair, you have got that kind of leeway where you could survey the audience and do like they did in the, in the hearing up on the Hill this week and say how many are in favor, and, you know, 95% of the room was in favor or opposed to the, the mandate from the Biden administration. But we've got that same latitude where you could do something like that in a board meeting to recognize the intent of the public who's attended. And we've also, we've, we've had more than just six people sign up so that we could look and see if there was a, 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 you know, different opinions or different topics to give people an opportunity that want to speak. Because one of the criticisms that we hear, at least I've heard, and I think several of the board members have, is um, there are times where one group takes all six spots. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they take all 12 with workshop and business meetings. So, uh, and again, that, that has come to more than one board member, but uh, there is, I think, to your point, there is discretion. Yeah, so I think my two thoughts are Robert's rules kind of give us that leeway as a board if we need to adjust to a certain situation. I also think having an open sign up and then to following policy as much as possible because I think it gives a good framework for our meetings, but if we saw a pattern just as we're changing the policy now, it's something we could look at again. But looking back historically at all the data we have for the last several years, and even with more robust attendance at board meetings in recent months, the, the 10 comments should totally suffice. 
And I think too, just to clarify that what happens at the legislative level, uh, unlike here, is that the, the, the chairman of the committee at the legislative level at the outset can say, we're only going to allow 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 or we're going to hear from all of you. We, we don't, you know, as, as the presiding board member, the president of our board, at least my, my approach towards that would be if we sensed, as we did last fall, that there was a tremendous amount of interest in people making a public comment, then I would talk to board members prior to, that, to the night that we were there. I mean, if, if, we, if we had that kind of information come to us, um, I wouldn't want to, on the spot, you know, by raise of hands. I think, I think that we would handle it just like we did last fall. And we would get our, you know, our minds together and decide what would be the best. Because really we have to decide that as a board. That, that I don't believe, maybe Mr. Onofrio can correct me, but I don't believe that the board president or the presiding board member has total latitude to do that. That that would be something be that we would Be through a motion. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's correct, President. Okay. Other discussion? So again, board, we are uh, so, vote. Can I have one thing? Uh, yep. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Just on your last comments, I, my recommendation would be to be very careful about talking with board members outside of the meeting and making decisions about that meeting out of the public's eye that could be construed as breaking open meeting. Any other discussion? So the motion again is to approve, uh, as Mr. Onofrio has presented, the changes to 1B-030 on a first reading. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Yeah, I'm going to say no. That motion passes with a vote of five to two with two dissenting votes. Mr. Onofrio, thank you. Let's go to board reports. Uh, Mr. Eckersley, anything? No. Nothing from me, Ms. Gerard. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to comment. Um, I, I so enjoyed touring the home built by the Leighton High School students. That was a great opportunity, and one of the things that um, is something that is a lot of fun, and as being a board member, to be able to witness that, and uh, so fulfilling to be able to talk to um, one of the students Jesse that participated in building that and their amazing instructor and uh, that was just a great day and um, it also highlighted our great partnership that we have with Davis Technical College as well as Layton City and um, it that home is beautiful and energy efficient and just so very happy for uh, that deserving recipient who's Tracy Nickerson. Very happy for her and her family. So that was a great opportunity to be there. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Ms. Phipps? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, um, again, as we talk about how important it is to get um, public feedback in that, that uh, I did have um, a, a group of parents that reached out to me on some concerns about, uh, they really in the, in the end end up dealing with an aging facility at, at Clearfield. And so um, uh, expressing concerns about uh, some things that maybe fall into equity. And um, I had the principal, Mr. Keim, reach out to me and invited me, uh, along with uh, some parents, to come and, and walk through the building with him. And he, he showed me things on the playing fields and, and in the building themselves. And, and uh, I ended up there alone with him. But, I, I just have to express my appreciation that um, the, the, the thoughtful way that the principal met with me and, and showed me the things and, and pointed out things that he thought in the future might be concerns, but also showing me, you know, it, there's always those things about aging buildings versus new buildings, and one looks really lovely, and it's hard sometimes to, to do the old buildings and make them look the same, but I just wanted to express appreciation that 
um, that uh, Mr. Kime took time with me at Clearfield High to, to walk me through and, and show off the great things and, and not necessarily, you know, um, put uh, too much of a kind picture on, on something that's an old building, but um, just really appreciate it and, and his willingness to do that. And just again, maybe that, that point that I think all of us as board members really do want to hear from the public and when things are brought to our, our attention, um, that we'll do our best to try to reach out, especially with uh, situations if we can help the public negotiate um, the the process, then I think that we're here for that. And and so for that situation, I was glad to be able to see things. I, I, I do have some concerns after my tour, but then also have some things that I saw that maybe weren't as, as, as bad as maybe um, I had worried about. But um, just express, pre, express appreciation for that. And then really, again, say that I, I hope that people will kindly reach out to us because we're, we're, we're your, we're with you, we're, we're, we're with you, we're part of the public and we're elected to, to help negotiate our school district and, and uh, we're pleased with, with the great things that are happening in our schools but we always know there's room to, to improve and, and we'll, we'd love your partnership to do that. Ms. Mufford. Yeah, just a couple quick items to highlight some schools. Um, President Robinson and I had a great visit at Hannah Holbrook Elementary with the superintendent. Um, Principal Best is doing a great job there. Their staff is focused on collective efficacy. That's one of the number one indicators in the Hattie, in the Hattie factors, and that's something they're focused on in their PLCs. And they've got a great outdoor classroom that's about to open, so some exciting things happening at Holbrook Elementary. And then I, last month I neglected to visit a great visit to Bolton. They partnered with Weber State Athletics for their school opening, and it was a really wonderful morning where kids just felt welcome back to the school and, and started off the year strong. And then just a shout out to all the high schools that have put on some really great um, homecoming events. It's been a fun season of athletics and students getting back to a lot of, of those social activities and extracurricular events that are so important to their high school experience. And Woods Cross had a great parade for their 50th anniversary. So we're just excited to see the schools successfully navigating safety and balancing that with social and emotional and academic needs of students. Ms. Tanner. Ms. Stevenson. I'm hesitant to talk because my background is a little loud, but I have to uh, pay tribute to Hillary Lowry at uh, Burton Elementary. Uh, John and Julie and I had a great visit there. The um, mural that's in the hall has been there for years and it's so beautiful. I, uh, I know how old that school is because I attended that school as a new school, but it was so good to go back and walk the halls there. And I appreciate Monica Cox that we awarded uh, the teacher there and recognized her. I also was with Bridget and Julie to the Lincoln High School home um, tour. And, and the owner, Tracy Nickerson, was so appreciative. She was pretty much in tears the entire time. And it was so sweet to see that and to speak to one of the young men that actually worked on the house. It was, it was a great afternoon there. And then in closing, um, it's been a busy month. I've attended a lot of things and been to a lot of activities, but Stuff the Bus was fun, fun. And so many people, good people attended that and stuffed that, actually a warehouse truck, but the bus was there. <laughs> and um, pizza given out, I gotta, gotta give Young Kia a shout out on that one. It's, it's a great, great, um, activity and they provide so many activities for us during the month. September was a good month all the way around. And yes, the homecomings, I attended several of them as I am a football fan and um, they were fun to be a part of all of that. So thanks to all of our athletic departments and our administrations in putting those off. Thank you. Very good. Uh, board, we do not have- President, could I say one last thing? I'm sorry to interrupt. I, one thing I left off on my board reports was that Leighton High Girls Tennis took second in state. And, and those of you that know anything about tennis, it's, it's such a difficult sport to, to win state in because it's really a year round uh, uh, and you're playing against uh, a lot of people that are, you know, potentially on the pro circuit eventually. So 
uh, really a great compliment to, to Leighton High Girls Tennis and also attended today uh, President Mortensen in Weber State spon has sponsored a, a room in the Career Center at Weber or at Leighton High School uh, it's Weber State sponsoring the Career Center and they uh, donated significantly to development of that and it's a great facility uh, added to uh, our late and high comprehensive guidance uh, department. Uh, President Mortensen was there for the ribbon cutting and we'll put some pictures uh, uh, up on the website, you'll see that, but uh, they, they brought in some parents that were part of a comprehensive guidance uh, meet uh, right after and just great use of the facility. Um, President Mortensen and Weber State is, is really uh, doing all they can to, to facilitate uh, uh, earlier interest and better information in getting kids to that next level of education. So we are, are greatly appreciative of uh, Weber State and President Mortensen and their uh, generosity. If you're by Leighton High, please stop in and ask them to show you around and uh, it's a great, great facility. I was going to mention we do not have need for a closed session tonight. So, Ms. Tanner, Ms. Stevenson, we won't be uh, uh, piping you into that. We will, at this point, with no other business, we will adjourn. <laughs>